Hi. So now it's my pleasure to turn it over to our host for today, James Russell, Senior Practice Consulting Director and Head of our Transportation Portfolio here at Clear Result. Uh, so James, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Nick. Welcome one and all. Thank you for joining today for a discussion of vehicle grid integration or VGI. Uh, I can tell you that attendance for this webinar, uh, the numbers are climbing quickly. It's already among the highest we've ever had. So be sure that you are in very good company. Uh, as Nick said, I'm the director of the energy transition practice here at Clear Results. Um, uh, as much as I'd like to think you tuned in to listen to me, it's probably more likely to hear from this fantastic panel of thought leaders and expert practitioners whose arms I have somehow managed to twist into joining me today. Uh, so Garrett Fitzgerald is going to lead us off on our agenda with an overview of VGI programs. Garrett is the Senior Director of Transportation at the Smart Electric Power Alliance and has focused on energy transition for 20 years. He holds a PhD in environmental engineering from Columbia University and spent eight years in electricity and transportation programs at the Rocky Mountain Institute. He brings expertise in technical and business models of EV charging infrastructure, EV specific tariff design, energy storage, and demand side flexibility. For the past three years, he has led the transportation program at SEPA, working tirelessly with utilities to address challenges of electric transportation. Tirelessly, right, Garrett? Uh, Amy Finlay will then provide an overview of today's first real world example of a managed charging program. Amy oversees demand response and managed charging programs at Eversource, leading the teams that create and execute programs that reduce demand on the grid during peak times while providing a great customer experience. Before joining Eversource, Amy worked as a professional engineer in real estate development and construction designing and monitoring building foundation construction. So if you want a sound foundation for your program, look no further. She holds a BS in civil engineering from Notre Dame and an MBA from the University of Michigan. Andrea Neusser will provide the second program example. Andrea is director of customer strategy and experience at Hydro One where she develops and implements initiatives to build the grid of the future and serve the needs and expectations of Hydro One's broad customer base. She provides thought leadership and drives collaboration through industry working groups to enable innovative solutions and help customers with their energy transition. Andrea has a broad background in social sciences, marketing and customer behavior and holds a PhD in political science from the University of British Columbia. I love the mindset of helping customers with their energy transition because it is a bit personal and does vary from person to person, doesn't it? And finally, you as a member of our audience are invited to join this discussion with your questions and comments. As Nick said, we'll be using the Q&A feature for that because everyone knows what happens when you have several hundred potentially open mics. So we'll reserve about half of today's webinar for discussion. There should be a good amount of time to exchange thoughts with you. I want to spend just one minute on the why of VGI. Why now? Uh, first off, the vehicles are now decidedly out there in your territory, wherever that is. Well over a million vehicles were sold, electric vehicles were sold in 2023 in the US and Canada. A lot, yes, in California, a whole lot in some specific counties. But almost everywhere you look, there is such a county, such a neighborhood where EV adoption is taking off. And sure that right now there's plenty of attention being paid to whether growth is as fast as this or that analyst projected. But while we debate, the number of EVs in operation continues to grow. But that's not the only thing happening. Buildings are also electrifying. And this is all happening at a time where we've seen mounting challenges to build infrastructure and operate the grid through ever more extreme conditions. So simultaneously enabling adoption and managing those challenges requires customer engagement. And there we meet not a new, but a 
persistent trend of growing customer expectations, expectations that our businesses and organizations will rise to meet their needs in terms of energy affordability, to be good stewards of the environment and communities, and to make this transition as easy and convenient for them as possible. The people on this panel, and I'm sure you in the audience, take the responsibility of getting this all right quite seriously. And VGI programs are, I believe, a key part of the answer. So thank you all again for being here, and I will hand off to you, Garrett. Yeah, thanks, James. Appreciate the opportunity to join the webinar and um, really excited about the audience that we have today. Uh, we can skip to the next slide. Um, so as James mentioned, my name is Garrett Fitzgerald. I'm the Senior Director of Transportation at SEPA, the Smart Electric Power Alliance. If you're not familiar with our organization, we've been around for a little under 30 years. We're a membership-based 501c3 nonprofit, and we work with our members who consist of stakeholders across the industry, utilities, corporations, nonprofits, consultancies, really any, any organization that has a role in the energy transition, which is a very large number of organizations. Um, and we work with our members to ensure that that happens in a affordable, equitable, and reliable way. Part of that is um, what we're gonna be talking about today, vehicle grid integration. So if you go to the next slide, uh, what I wanna share in the next seven or eight minutes is some high level learnings and overview uh, that our organization has pulled together over the past three years. We've worked, as James mentioned, with hundreds of utilities and many vendors and many OEMs who are at various stages of thinking about implementing and implementing a wide array of managed charging. And so this slide here is really meant to demonstrate that managed charging or BGI is really a spectrum of activities with all the way on the left, unmanaged, is helpful to define. That's what happens when a user charges their vehicle in a way without any consideration or signals. So that might be just plugging it in when they get home from work and it charges because it's plugged in. And then you sort of move up the spectrum. And I wanted to clarify when we talk about passive versus active charging, Passive is typically representing those time of use rates or time varying rates, but it's passive from the utility perspective. It in fact is actually active from the customer perspective. So that customer has to make a change in their behavior or go set a timer or configure some other automation. Um, and then you move over to the active managed charging. And again, that means active from a utility or an aggregator perspective where a utility is monitoring the vehicle's charging needs and evaluating against some optimization criteria if that's cost or if that's carbon and then actively sending a signal back to that vehicle so that it can charge at a time that's most convenient for the customer and the grid and then you move a little bit further and we're talking about bi-directional charging which if you think about it is really just managing the charge and discharge of a battery and there are two types of that. We won't get into too much detail today, but bi-directional non-exporting simply means you're not sending power back to the grid, but you might be sending power from your vehicle to the home or to the building. Um, and so I think for the, the majority of today's conversation, we'll be in that light blue and perhaps part in the passive gray, uh, but you can go to the next slide. So we are moving along that spectrum. The majority of programs that are considered managed charging are time of use today, but we're starting to see increase in the active charging. And there's really two types of active charging in my mind, if you simplify it, an event-based charging where the utility or aggregator might send a signal to a customer to stop charging in a more traditional demand response context, and that might happen a capped number of times per season or per year. And then you move further and you get to the continuous management, which is really just a, a continuous monitoring of the EV charging needs and signals being sent. And to get there, you need to make sure that that 
monitoring and that management is sort of the customer is blind to it. They're not inconvenienced. They begin to not even notice that it's being charged and they're just ensuring that their vehicle is, is ready to go. In parallel, we have a similar trajectory moving uh, on the spectrum for bi-directional charging, where today we're really looking at bi-directional charging as a resiliency option or backup power. And in some cases that's to a load or to a home. And then in the very early days of grid services. Next slide. So there are a variety of managed charging types that have different levels of sophistication. You know, as you're moving from an off-peak charging rebate all the way up to a bi-directional grid service, there is increasing value to the grid and the customer, but there's also increasing complexity, complexity on how you implement that. And so this chart is really meant to say, we are moving towards more sophisticated programs, but we need to make sure that we decouple that sophistication from what the customer experiences, right? And so a customer who's participating in a time of use program or bi-directional charging, they don't wanna have to think more. They don't wanna have to become experts on this. Um, we just need to make sure that they're, they're aware and they have opted into it and sort of let all of that complexity happen um, sort of behind what the customer is experiencing or observing. And we are doing that. And, and perhaps Amy and Andrea are going to talk a little bit about how uh, programs are designed in that way. Uh, next slide. So this is a fun side, at least for me. Maybe uh, maybe I'm nerding out a little bit. But we hear a lot about vehicle to X and sort of use nonchalantly, oh, you know, V, v to X. But the X and V to X matters a lot. And it matters because it determines what value the customer can capture. It, value, it matters because it, it has impacts on the utilities coordination and integration onto their system and it has regulatory and compensation considerations. And so just to clarify, vehicle to load is simply when you can plug in a small appliance to your vehicle. So it has an onboard outlet. And there are a number of vehicles that have that capability today. And then you move over vehicle to home and essentially this requires additional infrastructure. So you're pulling power off of the vehicle, converting it or inverting it, and then connecting it to the home electrical system. And then lastly, vehicle to grid goes even further and you're injecting power onto the distribution system. And this requires even more coordination uh, with the utility. And so uh, as we navigate this, we need to make sure that essentially there's enough value being captured to pay for some of the additional complexity that comes with moving from V to L to V to G. Uh, next slide. Uh, and so SIPA spent about a half a year in 2023 having conversations with utilities across the US and OEMs and others to try to get a sense of where are we as an industry at in terms of bi-directional charging. And this is a summary of a survey response from I think 38 or 39 utilities that cover roughly 40% of customers in the US. Um, and so 14 of those 39 utilities already have a, a, a one-off pilot that's testing the technology of bi-directional charging. And so what I'm trying to get at there is it's, it's really looking at the technology and how they can integrate in their system. And it's less so looking at how a customer might interact with a larger program. Two of the utilities have a capped program, meaning that a fixed number of folks can participate. And two utilities have actually adapted an existing demand response program that now is uh, able to integrate vehicles into that program. And the balance, more than 50%, have no pilot or program in place, but about half of them are in the process of putting one together and the other half have no formal plans. So the, the takeaway from this is it's early days for bi-directional charging, but the majority of utilities are considering it, are starting to test the waters, are putting in place programs and pilots so that they will be hopefully well-equipped to take advantage of this opportunity 
down the line when more vehicles come out with uh, bi-directional capabilities. I think I have one or two more slides. You can go to the next slide, James. Just one more, I think. Um, we'll bump back to that one because we might as well use it as an opportunity to, to promote the report. So this is a report that we did in partnership with Clear Result and some other SEPA members. It's where the chart on the previous slide came from. Uh, it's free. You can visit SEPA's website or Google the state of bidirectional charging in 2023. And it's a pretty comprehensive overview of what's happening in this space. So I'd encourage people to check it out. Uh, all right, with that out of the way, we can go to the last slide. Uh, and this is essentially what I've what I've already iterated. It's very early days in terms of mass market adoption of bidirectional charging. You are seeing customer resiliency in a in a commercial application um, in some programs in California and some other commercial applications throughout the U.S. But when it comes to uh, sort of the aggregation for fleet services and full on grid services, we really are in the pilot stage. And that's going to take, in my opinion, a couple of years to get us to a commercial implementation. But there are a bunch of folks on this call that are working on it, and I'm very excited about it. So happy to hand it over to the next presenter and take questions later. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you, Garrett. Um, certainly seems like there are a lot of ways to approach VGI programs, and you've you've laid out some some great frameworks to consider. We'll now turn to Amy for an overview of the approach taken by Eversource. And I'll come off mute for that. Thanks, James. Uh, so just for those of you that aren't familiar with Eversource, we're the largest uh, electric utility or energy company in New England. We have about 4 million customers across our tri-state territory. So it's Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New Hampshire. Uh, we've earned a bunch of awards here, as you can see, uh, you know, most notably for our Connected Solutions program, which is our demand response program that we manage. And for a while, uh, EVs were being addressed within that program. Uh, in recent years, we've sort of pulled EVs um, out of our typical demand response portfolio because we really see an opportunity to leverage that demand flexibility uh, in other areas, not just targeting you know, our ISO New England system peak, which is what our existing demand response programs do. So um, happy to dig into our Connecticut program um, a little bit further. That's the one that we stood up about uh, two years ago. If you wanna go on to the next slide. So the EV charging program was launched in January of 2022 uh, with some pretty lofty goals that we're looking to hit by 2030. The interesting piece of this program is that the sort of upfront incentives that a, customer, a residential customer can get on uh, the installation of their charger or wiring upgrades is then paired with enrollment and managed charging. So anyone who takes those upfront incentives, those make ready incentives, is required to participate in an ongoing managed charging program. So that's where this sort of you know, enrollment journey um, gets a little bit complex and James, you know. I think we deal with that sort of on a day-to-day -day basis with, you know, it's not just one thing to sort of process a rebate application. It's a whole other piece, you know, to try and get a customer's device actually connected so that you can do that sort of sophisticated load management. Uh, for the Connecticut program, we do have um, a requirement that we, we do that active control uh, for participation in demand response events and more sophisticated scheduled charging. Um, so to Garrett's, you know, sort of, uh, I guess, level of sophistication with our managed charging programs. Um, we're sort of in that, we've got the passive program that you can run with the data, like an off-peak rewards program, but then we're really focused on this sort of active management component and just starting to dip our toes a bit in the bi-directional space. Uh, this just gives a little bit of a, a detail about what those upfront incentives are for the Make Ready program. So you, residential customers can get up to $1,000 on the installation. Um, we do have in, uh, incentives for commercial installations as well. We don't have as robust of managed charging offerings in that space yet, but we are in development uh, for, for light duty fleets and for multi-unit dwellings specifically. Um, we're really getting pushed to you know, kind of push the envelope in terms of you know, how we're reaching th those different customer segments. Um, we've got the ongoing incentives for managed charging uh, that I think we get into a little bit more detail. Um, on the next slide, you can see that little uh, diagram by month. That's what, if, if you go back to the previous one, sorry. 
Um, this is what James and his team, you know, have really, have really been helping us out with over the last couple of weeks, is, or last couple of years, I'm sorry, is, is tracking sort of the applications over time uh, for customers coming into the program and all the different sort of options um, that we're seeing from, from program participants. And I, I will just one note something here sort of on the, the last bullet as well, uh, that we have a pretty pretty complex program from a customer experience perspective because there's several options for residential customers. You could just be getting um, a wiring upgrade. You could just be getting you know, a rebate on the charger. You could be getting a combination of those two. You could just be bringing you know, an existing vehicle with a charger that you got you know, four years ago to this program and get an enrollment incentive to participate straight in managed charging. So we've got you know, sort of a whole host of options for customers just to get that you know, EV load under management is really sort of the end goal. And we've got you know, the upfront incentives so that you know, it motivates people to sort of come into our program, but really that, that end game for us is getting that EV load under management and visibility into it. Next slide. So the evolution of our managed charging program over the last couple of years, when we started, we had a legacy demand response program that just uh, focused on accessing uh, vehicles or through the chargers, and that was reducing you know, the, the level of charging during demand response events, which for ISO New England were summer peaking utility. So this typically were you know, three hour events, hot summer weekdays, you know, when everyone's cranking up their air conditioning. So traditionally we had, you know, that reduction in charging from level two to level one during that sort of finite window of time. Um, at that time, we also launched uh, vehicle telematics um, through a partner, so we were connecting directly to the EVs rather than doing the load management through the charger, which definitely allows for greater levels of sophistication. Um, and at that time, we were just doing the demand response events with the sort of compensation structure you see here. Uh, we were giving customers you know, $50 a month uh, during those uh, June to September window for up to 20 events and with the criteria that if you didn't opt out of more than two events in a month you would earn that $50. Um, fast forward to 2024 and a couple of years of you know program evolution and increasing sophistication and capabilities from some of our um, DERMS providers and EV aggregators that we work with. Uh, we now support four different makes of chargers in addition to 24 different models um, of EVs. And we've got sort of a, a two-tiered program. And from the regulator's perspective, you know, this, this is the baseline tier and the advanced tier, uh, but we've made it a point, you know, we go out to, with, to customers and try and talk to them about these programs. They don't know what that means. So we've sort of rebranded, you know, the names of those programs, which I think is a really important point to that sort of baseline or entry level tier being the off-peak rewards program and the advanced tier being scheduled charging. And that's where we're doing the active um, management and actually setting a schedule for a customer uh, by sending them a survey and getting their input on you know, their charging behaviors and then sort of managing that charging appropriately uh, behind the scenes. You can see for the off-peak rewards program, uh, there's a bit of complexity uh, to that because we do have an active demand response program um, or offering associated with the, the same hours that we're covering with the passive program. So we, we tell customers, you know, don't charge during the hours of 3 to 9 p.m. Uh, at any point. And if you do more than 80 percent of your charging during off-peak hours, we'll give you $10 a month. In addition, we have demand response, you know, the option to do some, some demand response events during the summer months, which covers that same window of time. And this gets into a bit of a, um, this is a regulatory requirement, but really it's, you know, sort of covering the same bases there with you're telling a customer not to charge during these hours but then for anyone that sort of is plugged in you know we're going to have the ability to intervene and and reduce your charging uh, during our demand response events next slide so then i'd end here with some uh, results to date so we've got over 4400 customers enrolled uh, in our program and those are the customers who have uh, you know, come straight to managed charging or they've taken any sort of rebates and their participation is now required uh, in the managed charging program. And what we're finding is that the ratio of customers coming in, it's about three to one. It's about 70% of customers are participating through their chargers, where around 30% are participating um, through telematics. 
and we've got 78% of customers in the off-peak program hitting that 80% charging goal. So that was something when we set up the program, you know, we we went on very limited information to sort of set what that charging goal should be. You know, should it be like 70%, should it be 90%? Um, and it seems that 80% was kind of the sweet spot with what we'd hoped for, you know, where you're getting a majority of customers complying. Uh, but the good part about you know, having this two-tiered program is for those customers who aren't complying, we sort of have a series of communications that we've set up to reach out to those customers and say, hey, it looks like you've missed your charging goal for the last two months. We can help you manage this if you enroll in our scheduled charging program. You know, would you like to complete this survey so that we can help you manage your charging better and you can be guaranteed to earn your incentives every month? So we sort of had that approach with the default program being this off-peak rewards program because it's the, the simplest for customers to understand. We also think of it as sort of like a gateway to getting customers comfortable with the idea of having the utility sort of involved in their you know, car ownership because this is sort of a, a relationship change for them um, and getting them used to the idea of paying attention to the times that they're charging and thinking about how you know this is you know, now an interaction that you have with your utility in a space where previously you were going to a gas station. Um, also wanted to point to um, that open rate stat for all these monthly off-peak emails that we send to customers. We're getting really high engagement with those, which I think is sort of indicative of the customers who are these EV adopters at this point, you know, just being really engaged and wanting to know if they're getting their, you know, their $10 or their $25 every month. Um, and we've got nearly 300 customers who've opted into that scheduled charging. Um, so those numbers are continuing to grow with customers who feel comfortable, you know, giving some of that um, or handing over some of that management of their charging um, to us. And then just a few uh, current priorities that we have. I think uh, I mentioned the complexity with the customer enrollment journey that we're looking to sort of narrow down to like a single customer touch point where a customer and you know, we engage with them one time and we get all the information from them that we need in order to process their rebates and get them enrolled and manage charging. Uh, we're always looking to expand our partner network so that there's more eligibility and we can accommodate more vehicles in our program. Uh, and then matching the charging schedules to distribution level needs. So this is sort of a, a new focus for us is figuring out how the customer programs that we manage sort of interact with the grid needs and those internal you know, relationships and working relationships that we need to, to work on to make that happen. And with that, I believe I'll hand it off to Andrea. Yeah, thank you, Amy. I just wanted to comment, yes, definitely a lot of very interested customers in, in some portions. Uh, the only time I've ever seen, and I've been doing programs a long time, a customer submit a sort of unboxing video of their participation in the program. <laughs> quite quite interesting. But um, Thank you, Amy. Yes, Andrea, would you please share uh, what you've been working on at Hydro One? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, uh, first of all, for Jared and Amy for giving your overviews. Uh, I'm a little bit jealous because I feel like you have uh, progressed so much more, especially Amy, than we have. I would say at Hydro One, we're still in the very early stages. So just a few uh, comments on Hydro One. Hydro One um, is a distributor and transmitter in Canada. We are the biggest uh, distribution and transmission company in Ontario. We serve about 1.4 million customers. And our customer base is mainly rural. So um, just to give you an idea, um, on our distribution system, we have more po wooden poles than customers. So our network is, is very sparse in certain areas. And that brings with it um, maybe a unique set of challenges. So we don't see um, a huge adoption rate of electric vehicles for now. But we know that uh, once the federal mandates kick in and once electric vehicles become more available in Ontario, which is definitely a problem today, we expect um, adoption rates to increase and we expect to see local distribution system problems before we see any bulk system issues due to the load. So we're keenly interested in really um, capturing customers pretty much from the beginning of their own EV journey and making sure that we enroll them in programs so that we can um, somehow manage their load and better understand their load so that we can plan our system accordingly. So our um, program so far has really come out of a demand response program that we launched recently. 
And that remand, demand response program was a bit unusual um, in the sense that it was designed to really meet local distribution needs. Um, we can also meet uh, bulk system needs, but we were really focused on where do we need to uh, enroll customers? How do we hyper-target customers in certain areas to avoid upgrades to the distribution system and really alleviate some of the stress? So we started off with smart thermostats um, and uh, within a sh pretty short period of time, we were able to um, enroll um, up to, like in, in about a year, we were uh, able to enroll close to um, 18,000 customers. And um, six months after launching the program, we, we expanded the program to uh, EVs and EV chargers. And interestingly enough, we actually see a much higher ratio of customers with EVs, telematics enrolling in our program than with EV chargers. Um, the ratio is basically flipped. And I think that has to do with the type of vehicle that we find in our service area today. It's mostly Teslas, um, and they tend to enroll with their um, telematics. So um, in order to enroll customers, um, we used our existing AMI uh, data. So we have advanced metering uh, data, um, and we've had that for about 12 years in Ontario. We have hourly data, and we really leveraged uh, a load disaggregation function and, um, and uh, pulled a list of EV owners that are connected to our service territory. And in order to enroll them into the program, we hyper-targeted these customers. So uh, we don't offer any, any um, installation programs yet, but we, we targeted a list of about 13,000 EV owners um, and sent them uh, an email. And you see um, like a snapshot of the email here on the right-hand side. So it was a very targeted campaign. And um, we, we told them about our demand response program and specifically the, the benefits that they could get um, as an EV owner. Um, and that was a really successful campaign. If you go to the next slide, you can see um, that within 24 hours, um, about uh, over 300 customers enrolled in the program. Um, and that was um, a really neat thing to see and how we, uh, how we could leverage investments that we had made in the distribution grid beforehand through um, our AMI infrastructure, how we could leverage that to, to really target customers for this kind of new domain and enroll them into the program. So um, with one, it really just took one email um, to get these first 300 customers. Um, since October, when we expanded the program, we have uh, enrolled an additional 600 customers to a total of 900. And most of them, as I said, um, have enrolled with their uh, vehicle telematics. And um, so far, our program really is uh, it's a demand response program. So we just uh, run demand response events. We are working on developing um, more of an e like a managed charging program, but we are still in the phase of gathering a lot of information. And what's really exciting about getting customers enrolled with their car telematics is understanding how they drive their vehicle and how they charge it. And that is giving us a lot of data right now to really understand what is the load profile that we're getting out of it. In addition to what we get through our, through our AMI, um, how do we equip our planners internally and our operations folks um, to plan the system accordingly and not just use uh, crude assumptions uh, based on, I don't know, um, experiences from elsewhere. So we're really using um, the data that we can gather through the program to develop it further. And uh, I can tell we have a lot of uh, room to grow and a lot of room to improve our program. As I said, uh, I think we might have to um, talk a lot more to Amy and see how they went on their journey. But this is kind of the beginning of, of our journey so far. Awesome. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, there is so much we could discuss here. There are such interesting differences between the territories and the regulatory and the way the programs are setting up and where they are in their kind of program life cycle. Um, I thought we might uh, discuss and kind of frame this around lessons learned in several different areas. Um, and though audience, um, this is a great time to start entering your questions if you haven't done so already. They don't have to be in these four areas. Um, but but just starting here, and um, let me actually I'll just stop, stop with the screen share. Um, 
Uh, just starting with the area of technology, uh, one of the interesting things about your program overviews was the different balances of chargers and and tele and telematics. Um, Andrea, starting with you, um, I guess if you had to choose only chargers or telematics, which would it be and why? I would say at where we are currently um, in the program, t uh, telematics are really, really valuable for us. So even if we don't call events, um, we are learning so much because we can see, um, because customers are sharing all of their data with us, we can really see how much do our customers drive, how often do they charge and how long do they charge for. Um, where do they charge? Do they charge at home or do they charge elsewhere? So these are such valuable pieces of information. And we are now in the process of really analyzing all of this data and creating different typologies. Mm -hmm. And we're using these typologies to then further uh, develop uh, our program. So for example, if we, not if we notice that there's a group of customers who are already charging off peak all the time because um, they are subscribing to a time of use rate, for example, that makes it um, the most affordable for them and takes stress off the grid, we can probably leave them alone and we don't need to offer them anything too soon because they are in good hands. But if we see that there's customers who charge on peak even though they don't really need to. So sometimes we see charging profiles where customers come home um, from work presumably at around six o'clock, they charge for about an hour, it's just a top up from like 70 to 80%, and then the car sits idle um, until the next morning. That one hour top up charge could happen at midnight or any time um, between um, six o'clock and nine o'clock when they leave again. So um, these are the really interesting customers that we try to understand better and that we would like to enroll in programs. So we're really analyzing the data to develop different types of programs for different types of customers. Because as you said, James, earlier, there isn't just this one customer uh, where you can have a one size fits all solution for. We need to really think about different customer needs. Yeah. Yeah, so a much I'm nodding. A rich I, would, I, would absolutely, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, I think, you know, Andrea, to your point, the data that's coming off of the vehicle telematics is just so much richer. I think one of the most important things for us is the state of charge. You know, and when you're just working with a charger, you sort of have to go off of, you know, historical data and come up with some assumptions, you know, about how much charge a customer might need when they show up and start to charge. But with telematics, you know that definitively. So I think from a customer experience perspective, like absolutely agree that telematics is, is richer. Okay, so I'm not gonna get anybody to go to bat for the charger only model, I guess. <laughs> they're, still, they're still very valuable. We'll take you any way we can get you, you know, but, but yeah, long-term I think telematics. Yeah, well, definitely both programs have a lot of options for customers in the technology. And I, I I wonder your perspectives and why don't you continue on first, Amy, like more more OEMs to work with means more fun, right? Um what what has been the level of OEM engagement engagement? Has it been enough? Yeah, I think more more OEM engagement means more complexity too. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if they're not all sort of coming in through the same source. So I think I'd, I'd like to address that two ways because there's the charger sort of OEMs and then there's the, you know, auto OEMs. I think that there's on the auto OEM side, you know, some there's a, a spectrum. You know, I think there's some that, you know, are are fine with, you know, letting all the telematics or EV ag aggregators, you know, sort of have at their data and leverage them for these utility programs. Um, you know, Tesla has that official you know, integration that they've sort of put out there and made available to anyone who who wants to use it. Um, I think you have the other end of the spectrum with some of the OVGIP OEMs who, you know, really think that there's value to working directly with utilities. And I can say that I'm interested in in that approach because they know exactly who has the eligible vehicles. And I find that from like a marketing perspective, you know, to to just sort of target based on, you know, zip code level, like EV registrations, you know, that's a little bit less, I guess, optimal than, you know, going to a customer who you know has an EV and saying, hey, we have this great program for you that you're eligible for. It's just a much more compelling you know, sort of direct marketing message, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and then on the charger OEM side, I think that there is, you know, 
we appreciate that the engagement from our derms providers you know and sort of facilitating those relationships and emphasizing the importance of connectivity and reliable data um, you know that's coming from these chargers because that is really what enables utilities to run these sort of programs you know th delivering on that customer experience and like even being able to you know calculate the percentage of time that a customer charged off peak isn't possible if we're not able to reliably like access the data uh, that is coming off of those chargers so I think it's sort of like on us as utilities to you know make this pull um, you know and sort of you know, let get the word out there that we think that this data coming from the vehicles and coming from the chargers is going to be so important for us and how can we sort of help to you know, emphasize that importance among the market and sort of get everyone um, you know on board with providing that reliable data um, to us that we can deliver the programs not only on residential side and on the commercial side as well mm. yeah different different strengths from different OEMs and and it's not just a it's it's just a single it's not just a single point in time too because it's changing. You mentioned the you mentioned the Tesla API, but that official API only was just kind of dropped in December, I think. A few and months everyone, ago, right? Yeah, right. Like, oh, cool. <laughs> and I think that yeah, that's another really good you know thing that I've got my eye on is this is you know a new new space that we're entering here. It's a very nascent industry, and I. I think that just keeping an eye, you know, and keeping a pulse on sort of what's going on, because ultimately I I want to make sure that, you know, our customers are having a good experience and that we're able to deliver on program goals. And that can be impacted by, you know, some sort of any sort of change that's going on in the industry might impact my ability to deliver on some of that. So mm. I think that, you know, as practitioners, we are best served by you know, leveraging some of the, the institutions like SIPA that can, you know, help to to keep an eye, kind of keep your finger on the pulse of like of, of what is going on, um, like in the market and, you know, just try and move it and yeah. in the direction that we want it to go. That's probably a, a good uh, opening for Garrett, like a, a pulse on the market, particularly in terms of V to G technologies. Where Where are those at? What does that landscape look like today? Yeah, let me just respond one thought on the previous comment of OEM engagement because I was I was thinking, you know, Eversource serves four five million customers. You're a large utility. OEMs are willing to work with you, and if 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 it's a lot of engagement that's required, we are going to have a problem for the 3,300 other utilities that are smaller and the OEMs are not. And 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 of course that's sort of a, an, an exaggeration, but I just wanted to comment that I think we're going to have to end in a position where one-on-one -on -one engagement with an OEM is not necessary so that the rural co-ops and the munis, et cetera, are going to be able to participate in these. And so things like what Tesla has done with that official open API, you know, like you don't have to even have a conversation with Tesla to develop a program to manage their charging. Anyways, but to your question, James, so the, the technology for V2G and its readiness, I guess I'd iterate again. We have some of the hardware, but the technology is still early days. The software is still early days. And, it, and in fact, to be able to do bi-directional charging, the vehicle has to be capable, both from a hardware and a software perspective. And there's not that many vehicles out there that can do that today, but it also requires additional power electronics off of the vehicle to integrate with the home electrical system. So Ford has what they called the home integration system. And that's, you know, a four or $5,000 set of power electronics that allows you to operate your, your backup power system. And that right now is a proprietary partnership between Ford and Sunrun, and there's not interoperability between Ford and inside GM or others. So if you had two vehicles that were bi-directional capable, if they're not the same, make and model right now, you can't interchange them within your system. So again, just sort of noting that it's early days. And, and lastly, I think to note beyond that technology, and I know we're in the technology focus area right now, but bi-directional requires new tariffs or, or customer agreements that allow for compensation for power that's injected. And 
without those, there's really no reason or incentive for a customer to do that. And then lastly, you know, utilities are 100% focus on safe and reliable operation and safety. And so when you're injecting power back onto the system, you need to make sure that that is safe for the line linemen, et cetera. And we do that, you know, with behind the meter storage and other backup power systems, but it just needs to be considered for the vehicles as well. Yeah. I am looking at the questions from the audience now, and there are a lot of questions from the audience. So we are not going to rigidly adhere uh, to our four categories by any means. Um, it's a good question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull some in here. Um, folks would like to know about the incentive structures and levels that have been set for the programs. Um, and they were quite different for the two programs. So maybe Andrea, you could start and then Amy weigh in on your how, how you went about setting your incentive levels. Yeah, so we did a lot of research. I'm looking at what other people are doing um, in across other jurisdictions. Um, and then we also um, kind of figured out what we can afford <laughs> because um, there's always um, the acquisition costs and then the question is what benefit do you get? So um, kind of balancing the two, I would say, we came up with a structure for our program. If customers enrolled their EV or EV charger, they get $50 up front, and then they can um, get another $5 per month um, if they stay in the program uh, and if they continue to share their data or participate in demand response events. Um, again, that's kind of just our opening um, offer. We need to figure out um, how we need how we are going to change these offerings as we develop more managed charging programs. But that was just um, for the first stage how we how we set the the incentive structure. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, from our perspective, the incentives are very generous. I think I might have said that. You know, just even the make ready incentives in Connecticut. I think it's really indicative of the sort of regulatory environment that we operate in, um, you know, especially in Massachusetts and Connecticut, where decarbonization is a huge, you know, policy goal. And any programs that can be delivered through the utilities to help promote that goal, um, you know, that's. I think we've got. I guess I don't want to go down too far of a rabbit hole here. We we have a little bit more leeway in terms of like cost effectiveness than we do through our traditional, you know, cost benefit mechanisms through our energy efficiency portfolio because this is so new and it's really, you know, driving more toward policy objectives than it is with, you know, cost effective energy efficiency savings. Mm. James, let me just share. I couldn't find that way to chat to the full audience, but SEPA has a resource called Managed Charging Incentive Design Guidelines. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and essentially, we evaluated 40 different managed charging programs to look at the structure of those incentives and the magnitude. And it, you know, it was funded by the DOE, and so it's it's very much available to the public. Um, and what we found is there's a wide range of structures and values, you know, ranging from 100 bucks in the year one to a thousand dollars in year mm -hmm. one. It fell around 600 dollars, largely because a lot of the early programs were meant to subsidize the cost of a networked level two smart charger. Mm -hmm. I think the takeaway is it can be a lot less if you if you are advertising it properly and, and the customers are educated that you're not causing them an inconvenience and, and so you don't need to give them $600. But so I, I, I do feel like we've shifted from those very lucrative ones to a little bit larger. And, Andrea, your point was, what does it cost? I don't think it's scalable to give $1,500 to every single customer because we we maybe don't even need that much managed charging. So anyways, check out our report, Managed Charging Incentive Design, if you want to learn more. Well, um, Garrett, maybe was another question. Was there anything in that report about structuring incentives to specifically appeal to lower income customers? Um, that's a question. Yeah, so the short answer is no, there are a lot of questions and I think Amy started to get in that role. There is an overlap of lower income customers and renting and multi-unit dwelling and both of those create challenges around having chargers to manage. There are considerations mm -hmm. on the telematics versus the network level two, um, but rather than sort of speculate, we'd 
I don't have great solutions. It's something that the industry is and continues to need to focus on. Yeah, I, I mean, just, I think. Oh, I just have one comment just about making it simple for customers. And I, I really think that went into our d design as well. You know, rather than paying like a certain, you know, cent per KWH save, that's not something that resonates with customers. So we felt like it was really important to just pay, you know, a consistent amount and set some really basic parameters that would, you know, $10 a month, $25 a month, very tangible. You know, we can pay the incentives out twice a year. And, you know, from like a branding perspective, it's a nice check that you get from Eversource, you know, for like $150, which like makes customers feel good. So I think that rather than just seeing like a, a bill credit and, you know, a set like per KWH, just from like a, a marketing and sort of branding perspective, I think utilities are best served by kind of making it something that's really salient to customers. Yeah. I also think I was just going to say that, um, you know, in the early days of programs, doesn't hurt to have a generous incentive that kind of gets the program out there, drives interest. You can kind of gradually lower that over time. And I think also you can create designs that are more tailored to where the need is, such as having an income qualified offering. Um, there's a lot of questions about, uh, you know, what, what, what impacts are being seen now. Um, Andrea, you mentioned a, a distribution, a targeted distribution system impact. So could you speak to, uh, well, first, again, how many customers are participating and are you starting to see those distribution level impacts? So we have about 900 customers enrolled with their EVs and EV chargers. Um, we don't have a lot of experience yet with what the peak demand reduction is, but what's actually really exciting is um, it helps internally with designing non-wires alternatives. Just having a program like that and having um, data and something really tangible um, has been a really good catalyst for internal conversations. So um, as much as the, the engagement with the customer was really valuable, also having it and um, and uh, as a, as a tangible program and figuring out how we need to change the program potentially to meet some of the system needs has been really, really helpful. So, so far we have the most learning from our thermostat program and just a few learnings through, um, through the EVs. Uh, but overall, um, giving um, our planners and operating folks the confidence that customers are interested in these programs, they are willing to enroll, they are willing to have their uh, their behavior manipulated and they become a reliable resource. These are all really, really important messages to drive kind of the broader planning forward. So I would say that has been uh, one of the, the biggest insights and a really rewarding process overall. Great. Amy, um, weigh in on kind of the, the level yeah. of impacts being seen. Yeah, I think it's so interesting to sort of, you know, Andrea and I are coming at this from two very different places. And I sort of long to be able to easily like recreate what, what she's doing, sort of, you know, that collaboration with solving really you know, distribution level constraints. Mine is more at the, the sort of macro, you know, like I mentioned, like the ISO New England level right now. Um, so really what we're, that's what we're managing to, you know, just those off peak hours. So even for the customers that we do have the ability to set more sophisticated you know, charging schedules for, we're really just managing them to the off-peak hours currently because I don't have that visibility into, you know, based on their location on the system, is there any you know, additional need that flexing this load to a different time could help to serve? Because we do have the ability to, to do that with these customers, they've given us that authorization, I just don't know what to do with them just yet because I'm still kind of working on that that working relationship that I mentioned. I foresee some ongoing communicating and data sharing <laughs> that's going to happen here. Um, cool. On the customer side of this, um, what what has the feedback been like? Is that another data point that is coming in as to you know customers are happy, sad, <laughs> you know, engaged, not? Um, Amy, please continue on. Yeah, I think I pointed to the you know the engagement that we have with our emails that customers are really you know interested in the information that we're sort of playing back to them. Um, as we've said, you know the whole sort of upfront enrollment process is something that really needs to be 
looked at uh, because we think that's a, a barrier to enabling like easy participation. So we're looking at creating, uh, you know, an experience that is maybe not you know, going to a portal and creating a login, but is it something that, you know, when you're logged in on Eversource.com, perhaps even like paying your bill, you know, if we have a, a question that says, oh, we noticed that your bill increased by this much, you know, did you get an EV similar to that, that detection once we have AMI, that will be an option. We unfortunately don't don't have it yet. It's being rolled out in Massachusetts and I'm super pumped to be able to do um, you know, that sort of EV detection, but then you create a really seamless experience for a customer with not only asking them to you know, confirm that they have an EV, but then, hey, we've got a great program for you and we can you know, give you some incentives for enrolling. Like it's just a really seamless sort of customer experience that I think we're looking to create. As far as customers that are like, you know, in the program, we haven't had too many complaints, you know, from customers that they're, you know, opposing about uh, you know, the, the way that we're managing their charging or anything like that. Uh, what we have heard is, you know, hey, you said that I only charged 78%, you know, off peak last month. I thought I was 83. So could you go back and check your numbers? I'm not even kidding you. We've gotten requests, like I'm talking, like the level of engagement is really, really high. So sure enough, in that case, we went back and we had like a like a day or two of missing data that then pushed them over the 80 percent mark. So anyway, wow. yeah. yeah. Oh, checking the math. I love it. That's right. <laughs> so you got to make sure that you're right. That's the other thing I'll caution. If you're putting this information out there in front of customers, you've got to be right. Yeah. Yeah. High pressure. Andrea, customer feedback, I think. Uh, so far, customer feedback has been really good. And um, what we, we're seeing is that um, we're clearly just picking up the early adopters, but these early adopters with EVs, they're very keen on doing the right thing. They just want to do something with their EV in addition mm -hmm. to just drive it. They want to make sure that they can contribute somehow. Um, and so we're, we're seeing real keenness, um, similar to what Amy is seeing. Um, and uh, we are doing regular customer satisfaction surveys, and they have all been really good. Um, based on their enrollment experience as well as their event uh, experience. And we monitor that really closely. And so far we have had uh, really, really positive uh, responses. Great, great. We are running short on time. Um, I think we've done a good job covering questions that have been asked. There's probably more, and I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question. Um, we don't have much time for closing thoughts, just about two minutes. So. Maybe panel, can we wrap up with um, a piece of advice for folks who are just getting started in VGI? Um, I'll, I'll pull up a slide that has some places people might think of starting. You can react to those or revisit a point from today's discussion, whatever you like. Just hear from each of you, maybe 30 sec seconds each. Um, Garrett, you wanna start us off? Yeah, and I'll be 20 seconds. So I think it's like a, recognize that it's a walk crawl a crawl walk run approach we talked about all of these different types of managed charging you don't have to jump into bi-directional charging right away that being said keep it in the back of your mind that that's a technology and an opportunity that we may be able to leverage so start slow but think on the long term great amy so i would say start from the you know the problem that you're trying to solve. I feel like that's you know gonna lead you sort of down the right path. You don't wanna you know over design something that doesn't really have like a specific end purpose. And I guess don't get too nervous in thinking that you have to have it perfect right off the bat. So it's sort of that balance of what's the problem that you're trying to solve? What are some of those sort of like preliminary steps to make sure that you feel you know comfortable moving forward in that direction before you sort of scale it more broadly. Great. Oh, and and this is the slide I meant to be sharing, but <laughs> in any case, Andrea. Yeah, I would echo uh, what uh, Garrett and Amy had said. Um, just start somewhere. It's a stepwise journey. Uh, don't get too intimidated by all the complexities, uh, but make sure um, it solves a real problem and has a, a hopefully an, a quick benefit to what you're trying to do as well, because the quick wins um, are really helpful to create momentum to then move forward. Great advice. My most sincere, sincere thanks to these excellent panelists, panelists, the roar of virtual applause is almost certainly out there. <laughs> Thank you for joining. 
Audience, thank you for tuning in. If you're interested in a follow-up conversation, by all means, reach out. You know, it's a small community working on this. We're all connected and interested in doing our part to further the energy transition. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you.